Welcome to the North Pentecostal Church live stream, a place to be family. Good morning, NPC. It's really nice to see you today. Well, I can't see you, but I'm glad that you're joining us online. My name's Evan. I'm the youth pastor here. Uh, we just want to welcome you this morning. We're going to open with a time of worship, but just before we get into that, I'm just going to invite you uh, to join me with a word of prayer. God, you are so good. We thank you, Father, that we are here united by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that you would speak today uh, uh, and remind us again that we are united because of what your Holy Spirit uh, does in and through each one of us. We are your body of believers. We are your church. Come meet with us today as we are gathered here. In Jesus' name, amen. Stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. 
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. 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 You are here. You are here. Moving in this place. I worship you. Worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. still every heart leans in until you speak like only you can speak everything we're longing for for the presence of the living god breathe like only you can breathe come and fill this room apart from you let it fall away let it fall away if it's not what you want to do anything apart from you let it fall away let it fall away every heart is open
just thank you for that cross and we just thank you um, that you are here with us and you are here with us at our home and we just pray for the rest of the service father that you um, are just in the center and we just thank you for pastor evan as he comes to share your word just be with him and allow him to speak your will through him in jesus name amen Getting to Bible college was really exciting for me because it was the first time I really felt like I got to study something that I was super interested in. And I say this all the time that I don't think I actually knew I liked school until I got to college. But I love being able to research different points of view and perspectives on faith and theology and philosophy and the Bible and uh, all kinds of different subjects. And then figure out kind of what I believed and what I uh, decided was right and put that on paper, write it all down and make my argument, make my case. Uh, it was just a really exciting, really awesome kind of moment for me where I was discovering so much about what I believed and what I really, yeah, what I really believed about, about the world. And I think for me as well, most of the moments of significant growth in my life happened because there was a moment of discovery. It was something I found out, not necessarily uh, information someone gave me or that I just kind of absorbed, but it was things that I, I kind of went out, tried some stuff and, and explored and discovered where I stood and, and what I believed about it. And those were, again, just these significant moments of growth for, growth for me. And some of you have these really great stories where, where you've discovered things about, about the world as well. And, and, and I'm sure you would probably agree with me to a certain degree, degree to say that the, the most profound things that you've uh, learned and the most profound moments of growth for you were a result of things that you discovered, uh, not necessarily information that someone just kind of handed off to you. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure you, you've got experience knowing that you can make the flames go this high if you add this to the fire, or it feels this way when you go this fast in your vehicle. Um, uh, that was just things that you discovered. No one kind of gave you that information. You just tried it out and discovered, hey, I kind of really like this, and oh, wow, look at, look at, how, uh, look at how, what you can do uh, with, with fire or with speed, for example. Um, and I think it's so important that we have this conversation about discovery and, and the important role it has in our growth, especially if we are interested in our own spiritual formation. 
And, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking a lot about spiritual formation, and I'm going to be speaking uh, specifically in the context of parenting. I think that's the one that's kind of the most widely applicable, but I, for any of us, whether you're a parent or not, uh, you can be invested in the spiritual formation of someone else, and you can be invested in your own spiritual formation uh, and have this principle kind of help shape you and shape the way that you you approach your your faith and your walk with Jesus. And it's pretty simple. It's that discovery is an important part of healthy spiritual formation. Discovery is an important part of healthy spiritual formation. And again, I speak about the context of parenting because that's probably the most obvious example of where we have values. We have things that we really want to pass on to our kids. Uh, and so we we want to know, hey, how do I get this done and how do I, how do I approach this the best? And, and I've got some kind of bad news, but I do want to be honest with you to say that this is a very complicated process. We know it's not just a matter of kind of saying the right things and, and, and giving the right answers, but there's so many uh, factors that influence what we believe and what we end up taking with us that, that this whole process of spiritual formation and passing on your values to the next generation is kind of complicated and gets kind of difficult. But I think, again, going back to this principle of discovery as an important part of healthy spiritual formation helps us kind of structure and strategize a little bit better as parents or as people who are invested in the spiritual development of others. Because the, 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 the picture we often have is we think about it, and this is a phrase that we use all the time to say we're passing the baton, right? We're passing on uh, the baton to kind of the next generation. And that's, I guess, helpful for a little, for, for, for kind of the idea of what we're trying to accomplish but I've got a few issues with that because, again, let's, let, well, let's, think about, let's think about just a relay race as it is. When, when one runner goes to pass the baton to the next runner, usually the next runner wants to take the baton, right? There's, there's no argument that goes back and forth. They don't stop and say, well, your baton doesn't look so right or uh, it, it, do, it doesn't work so well for me. I don't want to take it. They don't stop and argue. They just kind of take it and run because the idea is you want to win the race, obviously, and, and get to the end uh, get to the end as fast as possible. So there's no, there's no arguing. There's no fussing going on. When the baton is being passed, the other person takes it. Now, I wonder if you have had such an easy time passing on the baton of faith uh, to your kids. Has it been that straightforward of just simply, you know, identifying the things that you've believed, you've figured out life, all your decades of wisdom and experience, you've put it all together, and when you were ready to give it off, what happened? Well, usually it's not as easy as just, I figured this out, and if I just give them the answers, if I just give my kids the right information, they're going to be able to take this and run with it. It's usually not as easy as that, and I don't think it actually works that way either. I think maybe a helpful, a better image for us, a more helpful metaphor is to think of it as if we are on the beach, and we've all kind of built these sand castles, and that's what our faith really is. It's just us kind of putting things together and shaping and discovering and, and trying to figure out really what our faith looks like. And so we've done that for ourselves. You as a parent have done that for yourself. And your child now is in the process of doing it for themselves as well. Here's the challenge, is we don't get to build their sandcastle. It's their sandcastle. They get to develop it. And we might have influence. We might have moments where we can speak into things and point things out. But ultimately, it's your kid's sandcastle. And ultimately, it's your kid's faith. And here's where we really wrestle as parents, and here's where we really wrestle as people who, who are either discipling or we're invested in the spiritual formation of others, is that eventually the sandcastle starts to look a lot different than, the, than, than ours. The sandcastle doesn't, uh, doesn't quite fit or match the one that we had built for ourselves. And we get kind of nervous with that because, well, we don't know if it's going to work. We don't know if it's going to stand. Is it, is, it, is it going to last? Do they have all the right pieces in place? Are you sure about that part, right? That's where we start to worry as parents. And I think it brings me great comfort, at least as, as a new parent myself, it brings me great comfort to know that all throughout uh, church history and all throughout Scripture, is, is moments of, of individuals and, and characters 
who God uses in incredible ways, even though their faith from all other perspectives looks weak. Even though their lives look like they are so unqualified and unprepared, God has a habit of using the weak to lead the strong. And we're going to talk about one of those characters in particular today. His name uh, was David, and we're going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32 to 50. If you've got a Bible, it's going to be on the screen, but if you've got a Bible, you can turn to that as well right now. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32 uh, to 50. And, and David is, is one of the primary characters of the Bible. And he, he actually enters the Bible, he enters the story as a shepherd boy who has been chosen to be the next king of Israel. And as time goes on, the current king of Israel, King Saul, actually hires David as a musician to, to play music uh, when King Saul is in the middle of a, of, of a rage. King Saul, he had a terrible anger at, at a certain point in his life uh, to the point that he was threatening to kill and attempted to kill uh, a lot of the people around him, and at times actually including David himself, the musician who was hired to calm him down. So maybe David wasn't a very good musician. We don't, we don't know. But uh, I, either way, uh, King Saul would get into these rages. And so David's job, uh, he really had two jobs. He was a shepherd for, for his father's sheep. Uh, and he was also a musician in the court of King Saul to help calm him down. And as time went on, ancient Israel eventually went to war against the Philistines. They were another nation who were kind of uh, Israel's arch enemies. And they go to war and they, they, they set up camp on two opposing hills with a valley in between them. And David's three oldest brothers, they are, are in, the, in the army. They're part of the Israelite army. And so they are off to battle. And uh, it's, it's there on these two hills. Again, these two nations are camped up facing each other. They can see quite clearly what's going on and, and understand a little bit and see what's, what's happening. And it was here that David's three oldest brothers and the rest of the Israelite army get their first glimpse at Goliath. Goliath uh, came out of the Philistine ranks. He is, he's nine feet tall, and the Bible says that he had a, a breastplate made of chain mail that weighed over 125 pounds. He had a spear that was the size of a weaver's beam. Like He was a massive, massive individual. And he came out of the Philistine ranks and challenged the Israelite army to find someone who could engage with him in a one-on-one -on -one battle that would decide the fate of the rest of the war. And he came out saying, listen, bring your best fighter. And whoever wins this battle is going to decide the fate of this war. We will become the slaves of the person who, who wins this battle against me. If you can defeat me, our whole nation, this Philistine nation, will become the slaves of the ancient Israelites. And he did this for 40 days. Every single day, coming out of the ranks and challenging the ancient Israelite army. Meanwhile, back at the ranch literally back at the ranch, David was watching his, his father's sheep when his father Jesse asked him to go bring some food to his brothers and bring back a report on how they're doing. So David gets to the battlefield and ultimately what he sees is a huge gap in leadership. Because what's supposed to be going on and what is supposed to happen is that when there's a challenge like this, the person who should step up first to, to engage in this battle is the king. And David shows up, he sees this giant taunting and challenging the Israelites. And where is King Saul? King Saul's at the back of the encampment, waiting for someone else to volunteer, waiting for someone else to, to step up to the plate. And so David eventually, he actually gets, he manages to get a seat with, with King Saul. And that's where we're going to jump into the story today. It's 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. It says this, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul, I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. 
when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. From Saul's perspective, and really everybody else's perspective, David was not a warrior. He had never been to battle. He had the, the, really, at the end of the day, like the only things he had defended it himself, I mean, we look at this and think it's intense and, and kind of scary, uh, but he had only defended himself against other animals. And, you know, he's, he's young. He's kind of, you know, he's a little bit soft. He likes to play music. He likes to write poems. Um, he's not like your typical picture of a warrior who's seen the horrors of battle and who is you know, uh, had to see just gruesome things and who's been scarred by that. He's just kind of a young kid. And Saul looks at him and thinks, no, you're not it. You're not the one. You're not the warrior. You're a young boy. You, you take care of sheep. You play the harp for me. It's not you. And David tries to build his case up again by saying, well, listen, I've, I've, de I've defeated lions and bears when they go to attack sheep. And I actually don't think, I just, this is kind of me reading into this a little bit. I'm not sure he actually convinced Saul that he was going to be a really great warrior. I think Saul was just out of options because Saul wasn't going to step up to the plate. That was for sure. And no one else seemed to be doing it either. So David right now is the only one who has volunteered to face off against the nine-foot warrior from the Philistines. And I think Saul's, again, Saul's just out of options. Uh, and so the story continues that Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Good luck. In verse 38, then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. And Saul turned to his assistant as they watched David walk towards the giant. And he said, we're going to die. <laughs> David is going up against a nine foot tall giant who has hundreds of pounds of armor and weaponry. And literally the only tools David is bringing with him can fit into his fanny pack. This is, not a devil, uh, this is not a battle that is in David's favor. And everybody watching sees this young kid walking towards the giant with a sling and five stones and his shepherd's staff. This is not, they're not convinced. David rejects the armor that Saul offers him. He says, I can't do it. Here's what I'm going to take with me instead. And everybody watching is going, no, we're done. That's it. David makes his way across the valley, and the story continues. Verse 41. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield-bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. In verse 45, David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. 
And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. And then Saul turned to his assistant again after hearing these words and said, we are really going to die now. And I know, because we get really excited, we, we, most of us know the end of the story, I'm not going to spoil it right now, but most of us know the end of the story, and we get really, really excited, like, wow, look at that courage, look at that boldness, he's just he's speaking these incredibly strong words to this giant, like, yeah, you go, David. You need to think of it, though, from the Israelites' perspective and from King Saul's perspective. They have watched this teenage kid, again, with with weapons that he bought from Canadian Tire going up against military-grade technology, and the entire fate of the nation is resting on him. And he decides to begin taunting the nine-foot-tall giant with military-grade technology and hundreds of pounds of armor on him. Everybody watching that is thinking, this is an overconfident 16-year-old. This is, this is not a battle that is in David's favor. The odds are completely against him. And he goes up and begins taunting the giant. So the story continues in verse 48. Things are not looking good for Israel. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag, or fanny pack, and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. And I'm sure, this isn't in the text, but this is kind of what I'm reading into it, is that I'm sure David discovered a little bit of what it meant to be the king of a nation. Because that's exactly what he did in this story is he stepped into a king's role underprepared, underqualified, and by everybody, by all outside appearances was going to die and lose uh, the battle and, and really as a result lose the war. And he walked in and he killed Goliath doing what the king should have done. And the, the battlefield was, was tilted the other way. And I think David had it so, so right when he said that, that it, it's not necessarily me, but it's the Lord who will conquer you. And that's really what we need to pull out of this text, is that it's not just, it's not because David got lucky necessarily, it's because the Lord was at work in that situation. And what he says is that it's the Lord's battle, and the Lord rescues his people. It was the Lord who won. It was the Lord who was victorious. Against the odds, God won. And this story points to another event in history that happened thousands of years later where God won another victory despite all outside appearances. Jesus Christ was crucified. And when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, his disciples were all thinking the same thing. That God's kingdom hadn't come. That Jesus was not who he said he was. And that they had either been lied to or tricked or manipulated and ultimately had wasted the last three years of their lives. It did not look like Jesus had accomplished anything when he was hanging on the cross. And it it wasn't until three days later when Jesus resurrected that the disciples discovered, much to their delight, that God, in fact, was victorious, that in in a strange twist of circumstances, that death actually paved way to life, that God's kingdom had, in fact, come, that Jesus was the Messiah he claimed to be, and that they had been right all along, and that God was victorious, inviting them to share in the victory. But to everyone outside looking in, it certainly did not look that way when Jesus was hanging on the cross. So maybe it shouldn't surprise us when our kids' sandcastles look like they can't stand. 
Maybe it shouldn't surprise us then when our kids' faith looks so different than ours. And then we, we, maybe we even wonder if they even follow Jesus still. Because really the world is so much different for them. And they're walking into a new world. They're walking into a, a new situation with new Goliaths and new battles and, and, and new things they need to face. And that's going to require a different faith. That's going to require different weaponry. Uh, that's going to require things that we're going to look at and we're going to think as parents or as people who are invested in their formation that I, I don't know. I, I, it looks like the odds are against your favor. But the victory is God's. The victory is God's. And so our question as parents is, how do we help them walk in that victory? There's an author by the name of Bob Goff, and he tells this incredible story. Uh, and it's actually not even a parenting story. This is, uh, this is so cool. Uh, he has been very involved in Uganda doing incredible amounts of humanitarian work. Uh, it's helping with the court systems and the prison systems there. And one story he tells is... Um, of how there are these, these witch doctors, and because of their practices, they'll actually mutilate uh, little boys and use their body parts as part of their ceremonies and practices. It's really gruesome and really kind of, kind of a horrible thing. And normally, these, the, the little boys, they end up dying as a result. And, and because of that, it's really hard to get a conviction for these witch doctors who are engaged in these horrific practices. And... And a circumstance came up where uh, one of these boys actually didn't die. And because he didn't die, he could tell the story. He could in identify who had done this to him. And, 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 and this author, Bob Goff, he was part of it. He was part of this whole process. And they, 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 they figured out this witch doctor. It was a witch doctor by the name of Kabi. And Kabi was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. And there's so much that goes on in this story, but I just want to focus on uh, uh, what, what ends up happening with Kabi because Bob Goff, this author, uh, visits him in prison. And Kabi shares about what happened to him through witchcraft and, and, and what he's experienced and what that's led him to do. And he says to, the, to this author that I just need forgiveness. And eventually Kabi comes to Christ. And eventually what Kabi wants to do as he's growing and studying and learning about his, his newfound faith is Kabi wants to present the gospel to the 3,000 other inmates who are in the prison with him. 3,000 other death row inmates. And Bob Goff, he tells this story of, of being uh, in front of this huge crowd of prisoners with Kabi and Kabi shares the gospel message. And you know what? Kabi messed it up. He didn't get it right. He got the stories wrong. He got the verses wrong. But he, this is what Bob Goff says. And it's so powerful. Is that the one thing that Kabi did get right. Was Jesus. And that's a circumstance I think. That just highlights this. That unqualified. Unprepared. Doesn't have the past. Doesn't have the education. Has this horrific story attached to his name. And yet God uses him in such a powerful. Incredible way. And I think what this story illustrates as well is that Kabi got kind of the bottom line right. Jesus. And I think for us as parents and us as people who are invested in the spiritual formation of others, I think we need to come to a place where we decide, hey, what are those bottom lines? What's kind of like the foundational things that our kids need to get right? What is it, like a good question maybe to frame it in this way is to say, what are the minimum requirements for salvation? Because God's incredibly gracious. And, and, and if you know the Bible, you know that it's by grace you've been saved through faith and that, uh, and that Jesus Christ died for us, that God showed his love for us even while we were still sinners and that God has prepared good works in advance for us to do. Uh, we know about the grace of God. We know about his forgiveness. And so, so then for us to ask ourselves, what at the end of the day does salvation require? Because some of us are so grieved at the decisions our kids are making uh, because we think it's actually affected their salvation. 
And it doesn't mean that anything outside of that is unimportant. But at the end of the day, like, what are the things that we just, we definitely want our kids to get right? What are those foundational elements? Now, I think when we talk about salvation, this is, this is so comforting to me, too, is to know that God is so, again, it's so, he's so gracious and so patient. And, and I don't think he's looking for ways to keep people out of heaven. He's not looking for ways to keep people out of his kingdom because he created his kingdom for people. He created it for us, that we could be his people. He could be our God. We could be united. We could enjoy uh, the life that he offers fully and completely without any sort of separation or brokenness, that he could deal with uh, evil uh, in in a swift and, and, and complete way. He wants us to experience that. And so if that's the case, like I just know if there are people who I'm surprised are going to be in heaven just because God's grace is so big, then I think I can trust him with my children. And they might build a sand castle that's completely funky, that falls apart at times, that, that needs structural support, that has holes in the wrong place or windows where it doesn't make sense to have them. They can, they can build a faith that to, to all outside accounts looks like it's going to fail. And I can trust God with their faith because I know in my own life I've built a sandcastle and I've built a faith where I've messed it up just like Kavi. I've gotten my beliefs wrong. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I've, I've, I've experienced things that, that made, me, made me question a whole lot and I had doubts and, and fears and in some ways I'm still in the process of building that sandcastle just like you are. We're all in the process of discovering more of what God is doing in our lives. And if we can trust that God is still good, even in the process of us building our own faith, then I think we can take comfort knowing that he is still good and he is still victorious while our kids build theirs. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would give us wisdom as we walk the life that you have given us. I pray, Father, that you would comfort parents here today who who maybe are seriously wrestling with this issue of of conflict with their kids, conflict with, uh, with questions and doubts and everything, Lord. I just speak peace over those situations right now, that Holy Spirit, you would bring unity and love and restore joy in those homes. Hallelujah. Pray, Lord, that we would trust you with every area, particularly our kids, particularly the ones where we're trying to lead them down a path of righteousness. We're trying to lead them and point them towards Jesus. I pray that, uh, again, you would just give us the power and understanding to do that, that we would have influence in, in those lives, and that, Lord, you would, you would make Jesus so obvious and so real to them. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your truth, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. See the work of your hands, galaxy spinning the heavenly dance. Oh God, all that you are, so overwhelming. And I hear the sound of.